Chapter 4. It's been a few weeks since we discussed. So, Krishna has been giving in Chapter 4 transcendental knowledge. This knowledge that is beyond the modes of material nature. It is knowledge that gives eternal benefit. Material knowledge gives material benefit which by definition means is temporary. Because everything in our material realm is temporary. But this transcendental knowledge is eternal. And it also gives eternal benefit. Knowledge has value because it brings something to us. It gives us something. I have knowledge how to use a cell phone. So now I have the benefit of being able to use this to make calls or find something quickly. There's some value ascribed to it. So from this transcendental knowledge, Krishna said, what is the value that you can attain his eternal abode? So what is significant about Krishna's eternal abode? What is the value of attaining Krishna's eternal abode? Happiness. Ha happiness. No, no sorrow. No old age. No disease. No, no old age. No disease. No birth. No, no death. Yes. What else is significant about Krishna's we, eternal world? We can serve them according to. We can serve him. them. Yeah. yeah. Unlimitedly. So this knowledge is giving us eternal bliss and happiness. And what what do we need to know about Krishna? What what things do we need to know about Krishna in order to achieve this? From the ninth verse? His appearance, his activities, his janma and karma. His appearance and activities. And we discussed at length how his appearance is very different than ours how his activities are very, very different than ours. And the conclusion of having such knowledge is, Krishna is where we should surrender. We all need to surrender somewhere, because none of us are independent. We want to be independent, but none of us are independent. And how do we know if 100% factually we are not independent? How do we know for sure? We are taking aid that is not ours. We are depending on so many things. I'm taking, yeah. So we are depending on air, so many things. If we were independent, had complete control, would we ever get sick? Would it ever rain when we didn't want it to rain? Would we ever be short of anything? Why do these things come? Because we are dependent on something else. If we had true independence, there would be no setbacks. But instead, it is forced upon us. Right? This is a proof <coughs> that we are dependent on some other cause. 
Maybe we don't know yet what that other cause is. But we are dependent on something. We know that. Factually. Otherwise, nobody would choose to get sick. Nobody would choose to get in a car accident. Nobody would choose to stub their toe in a wall. From big to small. Nobody would choose. But we know there's some other force. So, by knowing that actually Krishna is the supreme force. He is behind everything. Then it leads to one conclusion. That we surrender to Krishna. We are surrendered to some other force anyways. So by surrendering to Krishna, we find this bliss and happiness. Right? So, Krishna said in the 11th verse though, His reciprocation with us is equal. Meaning, as you surrender unto Him, He rewards accordingly. If you want to have a loving relationship with Krishna, He will reciprocate accordingly. If you don't want to know Krishna, He'll also reciprocate accordingly. He'll even convince you as though you know if that is what you want. Some of us had such an experience last evening of somebody thinking they knew. I don't know, but if, if you want to be bewildered, you'll be bewildered. So Krishna reciprocates according to our desire. So, the key is now to find a good desire. What is it that I can desire? So in the 12th verse, Krishna said that if you are very eager for fruitive results, material boons, one will worship the demigods, the devatas. He, Krishna is going to speak about such worship a little bit later. So he's saying that is why some people will worship the demigods. So now, in the 13th verse, Krishna is, going, is speaking about how one works. What is driving one's different activities. Okay. This is a very famous verse. Some of you might be knowing this verse. So we'll read it. Somebody can read the verse in this verse. Okay. According to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer, being unchangeable. Report, someone can read. The Lord is the creator of everything. Everything is born of Him. Everything is sustained by Him. And everything after animation rests in Him. He is therefore the creator of the four divisions of the social order, beginning with the intelligent class of men, technically called Brahmanas due to their being situated in the mode of Brahmanas. Next is the administrative class, technically called Kshatriyas, due to their being situated in the mode of Kshatriya. The mercantile men called the Vaishyas are situated in the mixed modes of passion and ignorance, and the Sutras, or labor classes, are situated in the inner mode of material nature. In spite of us creating the four divisions of human society, Lord Krishna does not belong to any of these divisions because he is not the one of the conditioned soul, souls, a section of whom from human society. Human society is similar to any other animal society, but to elevate men from animal status, the above mentioned division are created by the Lord for the systemic development of Krishna consciousness. The tendency of a particular man towards work is determined by the modes of material nature which he has acquired. 
Such symptoms of life according to the different modes of material nature are described in the 18th chapter of this book. A person in Krishna conscious, however, is above even the Brahmanas. Although Brahmanas by quality are supposed to know about Brahma, the supreme absolute truth, most of them approach only the impersonal Brahman manifestation of Lord Krishna. But man who transcends the limited knowledge of Brahmana and reaches the knowledge of the Supreme Personality of the Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, becomes a person in Krishna conscious, or in other words, a Vaishnava. Krishna conscious includes knowledge of all different plenary expansions of Krishna, namely Rama, Narasimha, Varaha, etc. And as Krishna is transcendental to the system of the four divisions of the human society, a person in Krishna conscious is also transcendental to all the divisions of human society, whether we consider the divisions of community, nation, or spirit. Okay, so this is a topic that brings sometimes big discussion about the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them. So the verse again is, according to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer, being unchangeable. So Krishna says he is not the doer. <clears throat> but what did he say in the third chapter? You are not the doer. He said you are not the doer. He said, don't think, bewildered by your false ego, your hankara, that you are the doer. Who is the doer? What did he say in the third chapter? Three modes of material nature. Right? This prakute kriya manani. Gunai karmani sarvashaha. So, he's, there he said, you are not the doer. Because you are not the doer, you must sacrifice. But here he is saying, <laughs> what is he saying here? He's created by me. And he's clarifying at the end, I am not the doer. So he, we are not the doer and he is not the doer. So now what, what do we do? <laughs> is there a third party in the Equation. Right. So Krishna is explaining this four divisions of human society. Okay. So we'll answer that question in a little bit. I am not the doer. Krishna is not the doer. Who is the doer? Okay. So, what are these four divisions of society? Satriyas. Brahmanas, Chudras, and Vaishyas. Okay. And why Krishna created these four divisions? To balance so the system. one can exploit the other? To balance the system. To balance the system? To help each other to in the for the supreme cause, for the supreme intention of the society. To Balance the situation to help the supreme situation of society. <laughs> Explain more. <laughs> no, to, to help each other help for the supreme other. goal of each and everyone. Okay. To help everyone accomplish the supreme, supreme goal. goal. Okay. So, it is a way to divide society in a way that creates peace and harmony amongst all living entities. What is the goal of any government? To bring peace and harmony among the people. Uh, to make their citizens happy. Why? So they get re-elected. <laughs> right? If, if people are happy, they'll get re-elected. At least that's the current situation of desire. But that's the goal. Right? So Krishna created the system of everyone is divided into certain categories so that everyone can work together cooperatively. 
these four varnas are compared to the limbs of the body. So you have a head, you have arms, you have a torso, you have legs, right? Does the head exploit the legs? How good is the head if there are no legs? If there are legs, but there are no arms, or no torso. You see, and the body all work together, right? Legs carry the body different places. Head is the intelligence, the overall driver. Arm facilitates the fueling of the body. Right? The torso is the engine. You see, so they all coexist together. Like that, this four varnas, they work together cooperatively for the greater good. So this is Krishna arrange this system maybe due not maybe but due to impurity of thought the system became corrupt the application of the system became corrupt the system is created by Krishna but the application of it became corrupt but the purpose of it is to create a nice environment so that every living entity has a chance to come to transcendental knowledge. To awaken one's dormant Krishna consciousness. When things are nicely situated, then one can take to the higher purposes of life. So Krishna did not send to the material world and said, you figure it out yourself. You figure it out, you deal with it. That would be a very chaotic situation. Instead, he created a very intelligent system so that we may regain our consciousness and go back where we came from. So, how does the tendency then of each of us come about? Prabhupada says, how is it determined which varna I may be in? What is it based on? If I'm Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. What is it based on? Based on what I have acquired from the modes of material nature. What is it not based on? But birth. It is not based on birth. It is based on the qualities. Right? And in what mode are the those in the Brahmana class? In the mode of? Huh? Goodness. Goodness. The Kshatriya? Passion. Passion. Vaishya? Both mix. Mix of which? Goodness and ignorance. Passion and ignorance. Passion and ignorance. And the Shudra? Ignorance. And so how we acquire these modes? How did I come into the mode of ignorance? Random luck of the draw. My lottery ticket was, congratulations, you are in the mode of ignorance. <laughs> Past activities. As I choose my different actions, I choose the types of food I eat. I choose the types of music I hear. I choose the types of friends I keep. I choose the type of hobbies I make. Based on that, Krishna is going to explain later in the Bhagavad Gita. Each action is based in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance. So based on how I choose to interact, I acquire these qualities. And these qualities then bring about certain work that is conducive to those qualities. Just like if you have somebody who really enjoys building something, they enjoy working with their hands and carpentry and building something. And you ask them to sit and all day long write some papers. They'll be happy? Why? Because their nature is different. Because their nature is different. Right? You ask somebody who enjoys 
you know, composing music and writing. And you say, you dig some ditches. They'll be happy? So like this, we all have certain natures. So what happens when we work according to our nature? Peace. Peace. The mind becomes peaceful. We are situated nicely. So that is this system that Krishna has created, this type of work for the goal of creating peace in society so that people can come to the ultimate purpose. What is the ultimate real purpose of human life? <coughs> to know the absolute truth and that brings you to serve Krishna. That is it. That is the purpose of human life. To serve Krishna. Right? So, this work that we do, it acquires, it's acquired based on the qualities we've inherited from the modes, based on our prior work. Okay? So now, Krishna is saying, I am not the doer. He created the system, but he said, I am not the doer. Previously he said, don't think you are the doer. So who is right? Or he has said both of them. So what is there? Who is the doer? Nature is doer? So if nature is doer, then why I have any response? I don't get to choose what I do. I am a robot. If I am forced to do something, then how... Krishna can give me the reactions from that work. A government doesn't impose punishment or reward on society if, they are, if the person is forced to do something. Right? So then what is our role in doing? Hmm? Desire. We can desire. Anything else we can do? No. Nothing else? After we desire, what happens? So our desire and the, and the interaction with the material more is what makes it make the action possible. So desire Action. with the interaction, the modes of nature. Right? But there's still one more factor. Mercy. Sanction. Sanction. By? Krishna. By Krishna. So, Krishna in this verse says he is unchangeable. So we have to now define what this unchangeable means. And it's related to this sanction. So the jiva desires. I would like to move my hand like this. All I can do is desire. Actually, I cannot control anything beyond that. I cannot control the brain to send a signal down the spinal cord to the arm to move. I can't control any of that. Can any of you control that? We think we can. I don't know, false ego. But actually, we cannot. So I can desire. Now, who determines whether the signal is sent and the arm twitches? Who determines? Krishna. If Krishna says yes, then who carries out the action? Material modes, right? There are some chemicals in the brain that fire, some synapses that send a message. It's all matter, all, right? That's the material nature. But material nature isn't acting independently. Material nature is acting under the control and sanction of Krishna. But Krishna is deciding based on our, our, our desire. And? Yes. So our desire and? 
So Krishna is going to tell us later that don't think because material modes are carrying out all the actions under my direction. He's saying, I am not the doer. You are responsible for your actions. But don't be so egotistical to think that you are the independent doer. You are the very minute independence. And that minute independence is our desire. So we can choose what to do, good, bad, or indifferent. And Krishna will sanction. Again, Krishna sanctions based on? Huh? Desire and? Qualification. I want a billion dollars. Okay, Krishna, I gave you my desire. Where is it? Sometimes it'll come and sometimes it won't. How does Krishna decide whether he's in a good mood or bad mood? Whether his stock market portfolio is high or low? He is unchangeable. Unchangeable means Krishna is impartial. He sanctions based on one's qualification. Just like the police officer, if the police officer takes somebody to jail, is the police officer responsible for that person's suffering? So, Who is responsible? The person himself. The person himself. Right? If the judge awards some big uh, judgment, some money, to somebody. Is the judge responsible for one's enjoyment? Simply saying. So Krishna here is saying, I've created a system by which work happens. I am, he hasn't said directly here, but we know he is the controller of the modes of material nature. But work is carried out based on our desire. Work is carried out based on our desire. And what is qualified. So, as aspiring devotees, we have to figure out. What is the thing we have to figure out? What to desire. <laughs> That's what we have to figure out. Just like a child, a child desires chocolates, doesn't desire long life, doesn't desire world peace, doesn't desire a new car. Desire, ch child desires small things. But as we grow in so-called consciousness, we start to have a broader perspective. So like that, in our immature spiritual state, we may desire some small things few million dollars, long life, freedom from disease, small things. You think, what? Those are small things? <laughs> you know, mature consciousness will see, those are very small things. What can one ultimately desire, or should one ultimately desire? To be always in the service of Krishna. To be always in the service of Krishna. Because the service of Krishna brings about peace and happiness far superior to a few chocolates or a few million dollars. And we have to come to know what to desire. And that is what Krishna is slowly progressing our consciousness. Know me, know my activities. Now start to. Because he's going to sanction your desires based on your qualifications. He's going to sanction them. So we have to increase our qualification and increase the quality of our desires. Then, who is in charge of our success? Krishna. Huh? Krishna yeah, us. and us. Both are needed. Understand? Both are needed. When the farmer has a field, who is in charge of crop? 
drawn. Sun and so this is effects. Okay, sun shines, water rains, but if farmer is sleeping, not planting the seeds, will anything grow? No. But if the farmer is very actively planting the seeds, but no sun or no rain, will anything grow? So what is needed to create a good crop? Both. So what is needed to create anything for us? Both. Our desires and the mercy of Krishna. We cannot sit lazy and say, oh, when Krishna desires, I'll become pure. When Krishna desires, I'll you know, start reading Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes people speak this way, right? It is when we desire. And then Krishna shows mercy. Now we should be comforted that whenever we desire to know Krishna, He showers unlimited mercy. But let's not mistake that we are not independent in our actions. Like the farmer is not independent in growing crops. So neither we can blame Krishna for our actions, now that we can claim independence. Understood? It works together. And it works together in this system of Varna and Ashrams. Varna Ashram Dharma. Now where does the devotee sit in this Varna Ashram system? Huh? More than Brahman. Higher than the Brahman is the Vaishnava. Is this a controversial topic? Or a simple topic? If there is no knowledge about what Prabhupada is saying, definitely it can lead to controversy. But if you understand what Prabhupada is saying, then it is not a controversy. And what 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 is where is Prabhupada getting his sayings from? From Shastra. From Krishna. Krishna has established the supremacy of Vaishnava over his created system. Who created the four classes? Krishna. And who has established the hierarchy? Krishna himself. Anybody else? Can comment? Anybody else has any uh, valuable opinion? So Krishna has established my devotee is the ultimate. Nothing. So this takes us to one next topic which is when one comes to Krishna consciousness, do they have any other duties, prescribed duties to perform? Yes. Yes? They, they have to perform their duty, but uh, if you do, I mean, if you do the devotion service, all of it is covered. Okay, so that's a nice way to say. We have duties to perform, but by doing devotional service, all one's duties are performed. This is a very important point. You know, sometimes in the practice of Krishna consciousness, we wonder, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. Different rites, different rituals, different ceremonies, different processes. But Krishna is saying, by the practice of bhakti, one has no other duty to perform. Doesn't mean we abandon our duty. No, but the duty is being performed by bhakti. It is the all-in-one activity. Nothing else is required. So, this is what Krishna is describing here. Stop here. Any questions, comments? We still have duties. Right? 
you see, uh, I heard from you on Mataji once, like, is doubting the duty, like, Brahmana's duty of Kshatriya, Arjuna did not give up his duty of Kshatriya, but his conscience got changed. Now, now he is fighting with Krishna consciousness. Yes. The duty is not changed, Mahaprabhu. You said once, like, uh, Bhakti is not only, uh, uh, how, Prabhuji, now, Kshatriya is there, uh, and uh, Krishna consciousness is there. Kish, uh, Kshatriya independent of Krishna consciousness, Kshatriya with the Krishna consciousness, how it uh, actually looks like Prabhuji. So this is a very detailed technical topic. It is called Daivi Varnasham. So the devotee is transcendental. Varnasham system is a material system. Where the devotee enters the realm of Daivi Varnasham. So one performs his duty externally for various purposes. But as you said nicely, dovetails their primary focus, which is Krishna consciousness, into those different activities. But one does not see that I have Kshatriya duties and I have my devotional duties. Right? In day-to-day -day practical life, we see I have my bhakti, I have my family. Just picking the most controversial, most challenging one. Let's hit it head on. Right? You say, I have my bhakti, I have I can only do so much as I have this. Right? That confusion is there. So that is the details that need to get ironed out under the guidance of Guru. How to apply them successfully together. And that is why Krishna says, he'll say later in this chapter alone, you must approach a bona fide spiritual master in order to understand how to apply this principle. The principle is there. I have no duty, I have my devotional life. And if I take that and say, okay, I'm a devotee, I'm leaving my family and going into the cave and chanting Japa. Is that the right application or principle or not? I don't know. Because I'm foolish. So I must approach somebody who do, does know. And they'll show me the application of the principle. What to do. So that is the how it happens. And what the application is in broad strokes is that between family and devotional life, I'll just pick that controversial topic. It's not controversial actually. We make it controversial. Why? Because we separate the two. My love for family is love to help those living entities, part and parcel of Krishna, also regain their eternal family relationship. I am the temporary custodian of that jiva. I don't take possession. This is my jiva. I'm a temporary custodian with a great responsibility to my dear father Krishna to help that child also regained the eternal fathership. Just like Guru. Guru doesn't take possession of the disciple. This is my disciple. No. Guru says, this is my disciple that I'm trying to connect to Krishna. That is what a bona fide Guru does. Similarly, as mother and father, we take our family, our children, our loved ones, and we say, I have been given temporary custodianship with a responsibility to also help them awaken their Krishna consciousness. Because my father is sitting here. How many fathers I have had? Unlimited. So who is this father for me? One who has connected me to Krishna for which I am eternally grateful. That is the responsibility. Otherwise, how is any different than any other father I've had? Going to the office, job. Job is a means 
to fulfill our spiritual life. What other purpose is for job? I have to maintain my family. Yeah, maintain my family so that they can progress in devotional life. I have to maintain myself. Not to maintain my sense gratifying desires. So job also becomes part of my devotional life. Because it is a means to the end. So like that, all aspects of our life, all of our different duties, but they're not different duties. They're all part of my spiritual duties, my spiritual responsibilities. But the details are left to Krishna then sends his teachers to teach us the application of the details, without which we are lost. We, we have a privilege uh, to uh, speak with our spiritual master or uh, our Shiksha Guru for the directions, Nagori. Like, this is my desire and I am feeling like this. Uh, I don't know what to do. Because sometimes this, this happens, choice, choosing, or this or this, India, US, or lots of things will be going in the mind. So we have, a, we have the privilege to ask with our spiritual master. So spiritual master guide us. Yeah, it's not only a privilege, it's a strongly recommended responsibility. Krishna says, Pariprashnena Sevaya, that you inquire submissively. You render service. So, Guru is not just some symbolic status signal. I now have Guru. No. It is a relationship in which we draw from. So yes, we must inquire. Krishna says you must inquire about these, right? So we should ask. Now, the process of inquiring from Guru is not like our material means. I pick up the phone and have to ask. <laughs> it is a spiritual medium by which Guru is speaking to us. Divya Jnana Rite Prakashita. We read and hear the teachings and from that, but your point is that, yeah, we must inquire. If we don't inquire, our own mind will take us in all different directions. But the best type of inquiry, if you go to a man on the street and you are very, very thirsty, extremely thirsty and you don't have any water and you don't know where the water is and you go to somebody and you see he has two buckets full of water he has one and you ask him you can ask him my dear sir is water this way if you ask that question he'll give you yes or no If he says no, now what? Suppose you only have one chance to ask. <laughs> Follow. Instead, how will you ask that person where the water is? What will you ask him? Huh? Please tell me where is the water? Right? And then he'll tell you you go this way. So what do we do with Guru? Often, we go to him to sanction our desires. Guru, I want to do this. Is it okay? Now you have put Guru in a spot not to be able to give you the best answer. Right? <laughs> we have put him in a position not to give us the best answer. Because he knows if he gives you a direction and you don't follow it, you will suffer. And Guru doesn't want to put you in a position not to follow the orders. Just like we go to Krishna and say, Krishna, please do this for me. Now we don't know, maybe Krishna had a greater plan for us. But now we asked him for that, he wants to fulfill that desire. 
So instead, how we approach Guru? Guru, I'm having this difficulty. How, what shall I do? What shall I do? Then you're giving Guru opportunity to give the best direction. But if we ask to sanction this action, then you, you're putting them in a problem. Right? So how to inquire is also very potent and very powerful. Because Guru is very merciful. Yeah? So can we expect that? You can. You can. But you express your desires for purpose of clarification. I am somehow having this desire to do X, Y, and Z, but I don't know. Is this what is best for me? How shall I do? That's one way to ask. Other way is, I'm having this desire for X, Y, and Z. Can I do it? Do you see the difference? Very subtle, right? It's very subtle. But the impact is very profound. Not so subtle. So it's good to express our desires because we're revealing our impurities and our purity, whatever. But we, re we inquire with a mood to really obtain them. Then we'll get the full potency of instruction. Otherwise, we'll go. Remember, Krishna said, Ye tamam prapadyante tam sataiva vajam yaham. To the extent you surrender, I reward accordingly. If you want the full potency of Guru and Krishna, Haribo. I don't know, but Krishna, I have faith, you know. I have these desires, I'm sure they're foolish, maybe they are, maybe not, but you please guide me as you see fit. When we go to Guru in that mood, or go to Krishna in that mood, then he reciprocates accordingly. So, yeah, it's okay to express our desires, our thoughts, our consciousness. We should reveal the heart. Right? It is one of the loving exchanges, to reveal the heart. But the best way is to give Guru and Krishna full opportunity to instruct us. Because again, remember, Guru wants to make sure one thing, that we are able to follow those directions properly. Make sense? There's a little tricky point. It's clear? Yeah. Have I answered your question? Yeah, Guruji. Thank you. Thanks for Directing the thought process. There's another question from you. Yeah. Wali Mataji. Uh, can we say the men without bhakti are Krishna conscious, uh, are part of four divisions of social order influenced by three modes of material nature, versus the men with bhakti are Krishna conscious, or uh, are the Vaishnavas who are above these four social orders and three modes of material nature? Yeah. So, once you enter the realm of Krishna consciousness, you transcend the modes of material nature. So you enter this realm of Devi Vanash. So Krishna says in Srimad Bhagavatam that you can perfect your Varnashram duties. But if you don't come to Krishna consciousness, you haven't achieved the purpose of human life. So it's just perfecting your Varnashram duties isn't sufficient. Just like cultivating the field isn't sufficient for crop to grow. You must still plant the seeds. But cultivating the field creates a good environment for the seeds that are then planted to fructify. So the executing Varnashram can create the environment from which bhakti can grow. But without devotional service, you haven't executed the perfection of Varnashram. So, um, Varnashram Dharma, again, is a material system. 
And when Krishna consciousness comes in, then we enter this Vaishnava platform, which is beyond the four Sith classes, and enters this realm of Devi Brahmash. So as soon as Krishna, because remember, Krishna is transcendental. No material him. Krishna says, I am unchangeable. Actually, this topic of unchangeability is fascinating. Every moment we are changing. Right? Krishna makes something, but how is he unchangeable? It's inconceivable. Right? I pull one dollar out of my bank account, my bank account is changed. Right? I take one breath, I'm changed. Right? I do any activity, I am now a couple calories less than I had previously. Right? I'm constantly changing. But Krishna is doing so many activities. Yet, he's unchanged. He's always complete. It's inconceivable for us. It's not so important here. This unchangeability refers to his impartiality. But beyond that, we understand Krishna is mystical. That he'll discuss later in Bhagavad Gita to inspire us to survive. Is it karma to who you said once, I remember, like time? We are subjected to the factor of time. Krishna is the controller of the time. So whenever we get subjected to the factor of time, the change will be there. This is a statement I remember from you once. Yeah. Time, time is present in the material world. It is conspicuous by its absence in the spiritual world. There's a spiritual concept of time, but not a material concept of time. Time is Krishna's all-devouring energy. It pushes one through the six transformations. Birth, growth, reproduction, maintenance, dwindle, death. All living entities go through these six cycles. And they're pushed by the influence of time. Nobody can stop it. And that is happening in the material world. Because the material world is temporary. But in the spiritual world, there is no time pushing us. But there is an experience of time to facilitate the variety of pastimes. That is the sweetness. That there is even variety of Time in spiritual, but not time that progresses from beginning to end, because everything's eternal. Time is a measure of beginning and end. If you study Einstein, and he's, he tried to define time through physics and through motion, he puts forth his formulas, is basically these Vedic principles of beginning and end. The qualification of our devotional position, right? We must improve our um, purity of devotional service. So, you know, we must carry on our sadhana, carry on our practice of devotional service. I can't sit idle and just say, Krishna, give me your mercy. Right? Krishna will give. But I have to do my part. And my part is to continue to purify the heart. Right? So I must increase the two qualifications that define how one progresses from Kanishtya Adhikari to Madhya Adhikari to Uttama Adhikari. It's based on faith and knowledge. What is the degree of my faith that the only objective of my life is to please Krishna? How strong is that faith? That defines my qualification to practice pure devotional service. So I'm aspiring, we should all aspire to increase the faith so that I can 
enter and have a higher qualification to practice devotional service. How to acquire that faith? Only Krishna. Krishna, I have no faith. But I know in theory that's right. Please give me the faith. Are we doing our sadhana <coughs> begging for Krishna's mercy to give us this faith? Krishna, my knowledge of Shastra is still meandering. Please give me the essence of knowledge. I don't need to know vast volumes of literature. I need to understand the essence of it. But it is bewildering me, escaping me. So we should work to increase the qualification of our emotional practice. So we can't just say, Krishna, you purify me. You can. If there's an intense desire, it will happen. But we must put forth our effort also. Our practice is sadhana. And that's why our sadhana is the most important. We should, I always say, put a moat around our sadhana. In a castle, they build water around it. So nobody can attack the castle. It's very difficult to get in. We should put a water moat around our chanting. Don't let anything else get in. Tired, this, that, this. <laughs> Nothing. Put a moat around it. Because we protect it. We put a moat around things that we value. Related to the material, so my I have acquired certain modes and tendencies based on my interaction with the modes. My soul is pure; it is untouched. But my consciousness has acquired these modes, so it is on the bodily platform. So now, what to do in this material situation? Find some activity that will be suitable to my nature, so that my mind will be at peace. And then I can take to Krishna consciousness. But if that then peace doesn't come, I haven't accomplished much. So it's related to the body. Because the soul is purely connected to Krishna. So it is, it is all based on your action that decides where you are in this four types. And of course, as a person, I may be doing all these four. Yeah. Satya, your nature will be there with me. Some Brahminical qualifications. So, no, there is a primary. Just like the modes of nature, you have some goodness, some passion, some ignorance, Krishna says. But you, you'll, there will be one mode that is predominant. Doesn't mean if I'm in the mode of passion, I don't have some goodness and some ignorance. But one will be predominant. So, like that. But we know in basic principles, if a Kshatriya tries to be a Brahmana, it doesn't work. Kshatriya has to be angry, fighting, ferocious. But if a Brahmana is ferocious and angry, it doesn't work. Right? And like that, we can say all the different divisions. So there is suitable work for all. If the head tries to walk, it doesn't work. Right? But if the legs try to be the brains, also doesn't work. They both have to do their job. So, so go like, uh, say for a Satriya Sodra class, for the work to what they perform, they have to eat some, something which is not veg. Why? Who says? Where? No, where, where? Krishna created this Kshatriya, right? Yes. We believe that? Yes. So Krishna will create such a way that they have to eat his children? No. So now, more than likely, what happens? I am a Kshatriya, I want to eat, so I'm using my position to rationalize my need to do so. Sh 
So three years were never prescribed to eat flesh. Bhim Sain was a uh, eating flesh. The greatest of all warriors of all time, Arjuna, eating flesh. But if if I have desires and I want to contaminate the process, I'll rationalize. Oh, I had to be strong, so I have to eat flesh. But there is no shastric principle that says that. Now, Kshatriya practices the art of hunting. But there is also a very regulated process in the Manusamita. But how that must be carried out. Not blind, sport-like hunting. But one can say, oh, I'm a Kshatriya, so I have a right sanctioned by my Varna to do subjectivities. So this is the manipulation of the system to satisfy one's personal desires. But the system is not there. And that's why actually this whole system broke down today. Because there was an exploitation feeling I am superior. So I'm going to exploit. That was wrong. The system was not wrong. So when you say Vaishnava is beyond Brahmana, what do you mean by this? That it is superior. Just like you can say that the Brahmana is the highest class of society. Right, Prabhupada uses this word technically, right? But the Brahmana is the highest class of society. It's higher than a Shudra. Doesn't mean that one exploits the other, but by qualification, it's a fact. Just like you have 10 students in a class, there's going to be different levels of intelligence. And it's just a fact based on one's ability. That is not being judgmental. That is a fact. So like that. But one who comes to Krishna consciousness is superior in nature. Even a Brahmana. But the caste Brahmanas who are born into the Brahmana families reject such notion. Now why? Why they would reject such notion? Because now their position has been challenged. Their position has been challenged. Thus, they'll fight to subdue such knowledge. The knowledge is very evident in Shastra. So clear, crystal clear. But if the Brahmanas are controlling their Shastra, they'll not reveal that aspect. Why? Because it doesn't work for their motives. It doesn't work for their motives. The simple logic is like this. If a mother and father has ten children, what is each of their children's potential to love them? For the father and mother to receive love? Will they differentiate this child can love me more, this one can love me less? Ultimately, they all have the same opportunity. And that is why no matter what Varnashram system we come from, we all have the opportunity to reach the platform of Vaishnavas. That is open to all. Krishna says in ninth chapter, even your lowest of mankind, you can become my devotee. to observe qualification. There are Brahmanas who act like Shudras. We can say actually there are very few real Brahmanas today. 
one buddy used to say, there's a land full of shudras. We're all shudras. We are. Own it. Accept it. It's a fact. But by the mercy of Guru and Shastra and Shiva Prabhupada, we can elevate from our shudra-like state to pure Vaishnavas. It doesn't matter where I'm born. It matters where is in here. What is my nature? And just like it doesn't matter, you may be born in a Vaishnava family. It doesn't make you a Vaishnava. It cuts both ways. You must carry on, act according. Then that is your qualification. It is not birthright. Mind is a database. It's a hard disk, storage database. Mind just stores desires. All kinds of unlimited desires. That is the mind. But it is matter, as you said. But it is subtle matter. This is gross matter. I can touch, feel it. Mind is subtle matter. Above the mind is intelligence. Intelligence is more subtle than mind. Above the intelligence is false ego. False ego is more subtle. And beyond the false ego is soul. So Krishna explains this hierarchy. And explaining how to attack. Anyone remember? When does Krishna explain these? Which is higher, which is higher? Well, he's explaining how to attack lust. He's saying the lust has taken these strategic positions. And he's explaining how to attack it. So, but anyways, your question is, so mind is matter. It is subtle matter. Intelligence is matter, subtle matter. Then false ego is also matter. One of the material elements. Eight coverings. Earth, air, fire, water, ether. Mind, intelligence, false ego. Eight coverings of the soul. Now don't try to understand all the nuances of that subtle matter. It's very difficult. And you'll wrap your mind into a pretzel or a jelly bean. <laughs> it's very subtle. Very good. You can do it. Krishna has given the basic principles in Bhagavad Gita. But to unfold it, it gets a little bit tricky. How consciousness changes, how soul is pure, how it acquires this is due to the covering of a false ego. So we can understand the principles. This, this is a thing which I ask because how can you stay fixed in your sadhana? Yeah. You know, that this fluctuates. In you stay fixed in your sadhana because by entering spiritual thoughts into the mind, the mind becomes spiritualized. Just like if I have a thousand files on my storage disk, right? And randomly I write a program that opens a random file randomly, right? That is like the mind. Randomly these things are open. Now if all 1,000 files in my database are pictures of Krishna, No matter what file opens, 
I am seeing Krishna. But if I only have one of those thousand files is Krishna, and the other 999 are nonsense, and they're randomly opening. So how to fix the mind on Krishna? Put all the files in the database of Krishna. So then whatever randomly pops, we fill the mind with Krishna. So then, because the, the thoughts and desires are always going to come. That is the nature of the spirit soul being active. So the idea is not to stop the desires. The idea is to change those thousand nonsense files into thousand good files. How do I do it? I begin to chant about Krishna, read about Krishna, hear about Krishna. Slowly I am overwriting these nonsense files. So I'm not trying to suppress the mind. I'm trying to fill, push out the bad and enter the good. So the more I hear, the more I chant, the more I serve, the more I see, the faster the conversion of the mind. They used to accuse Prabhupada of brainwashing. And he said, if the brain is dirty, it should be washed. <laughs> so we are in the process of washing the mind of all the contamination. But the, we don't have a thousand files is the problem. We have like unlimited files. <laughs> so we have to do a little extra rewriting. But that's how it happens. So you can train the mind like that. So is it the reason you, like, uh, in spirituality you suggested, like, not to watch movies, uh, yeah. sports, because the file will be stored like that? Yeah, you're entering a new file into the... It, as soon as I watch a movie, what happens? I ask, what's the harm? That's the harm. Yeah. I see some billboard. Oh, what happens? Some desire. I hear some music. Oh, I want to do that. That's the harm. You're writing new files in your database. Now I have to work that much harder. So I'm trying to chant, chant, chant. But then I'm adding all this nonsense into it. I'm lighting a fire and pouring water at the same time. I'm, it's not lighting, this not lighting, but I'm pouring water. Stop pouring water, then it will light. Stop pouring the water. I'm going to the gym and exercising, but I'm eating two tubs of ice cream. <laughs> Eat one tub. <laughs> Not two. That is the danger. What's the harm? That's the harm. So much effort to unwrite all these impressions. And then I put new ones in. That's why Krishna says to control lust, he says, you first control the senses. You shut the windows to all the nonsense outside. Then, from intelligence, you engage in devotional service, both sides. Just like in the car. If you're a very, this, we'll use this, hot in the car. And I turn the air conditioning on but I leave the windows open. All the cool air is coming and going out. Okay. Anything else? Also it happens other way, right? When, if you are very sincere in Krishna conscious for one year, we'll forget the incidents, forget the brand name, some, like, we will be in a situation like, what was that, what was the like, we need a lot of time to go back to there. It happens. Detachment. Yeah. Detachment happens by attachment to something better. Yeah. That's why Krishna says, don't worry about detaching from everything. Don't worry about that. Just attach to me. Vishtva <laughs> Navartante, just higher taste. You'll naturally forget the brands and whatever it else that was occupying our mind. Let it happen naturally. Just chant, just read, just enjoy 
through Krishna consciousness and go forward. But at some point, a little bit of austerity is required. Some austerity is there. Today is a Kadashi. Some good austerity is there. It's good for us. Too much austerity is not recommended. Some is recommended. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Rata Koti Vaishnavinda Jai